Okay, now we're ready to start chapter 5. This is probably the most difficult chapter um, in this class because of how much information uh, is in there and how many different situations uh, there are. But if you learn to apply Newton's three laws, then this is nothing but an application of those three laws. And as long as you accept those and move forward with this, and this is really applying those into problems. The actual equations that we use are going to be very simple, but the thought process um, needs to be down to a, um, a real process, almost a flow chart in your head about how to approach these, what's going on, how to apply Newton's laws in certain situations, and then solve the problem. And as long as you kind of get into that pattern, I think you're going to be okay. Most of this chapter is going to be about problem solving, and most of the slides in here will be problems that we will solve. But what you really need to do is listen to the process. I'm going to try to explain the process each time, All right, the process and the thinking that goes behind it. And that's really what you want to key in on. Don't worry so much about, oh, this is this kind of problem, this is a ramp problem, this is a elevator problem, this is a... Um, friction problem. Think about the thought process that goes behind it and key into that and that'll help a lot. First of all we want to go back to our concept of weight and we said that um, weight is the force of gravity and the key thing about that is that that is separate um, from mass. Right? Mass is the quantity of matter uh, or the amount of whatever um, kilograms um, it's a it's a mass of something. It's an intrinsic property. Uh, weight, on the other hand, is the force of gravity on the matter, and weight can change depending on where you are on the Earth, depending on what planet you're on, whether you're near a black hole, whatever. Your weight can change, but the mass, the amount of matter that you have, does not change. Okay, and we can go further, and we can calculate this by using your weight is equal to your mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Later on, we'll actually call this the gravitational field strength, but for now, we'll just keep it as the acceleration due to gravity. Um, this is not necessarily a new equation, because we had uh, this before. We had force, in generic terms, uh, is equal to mass times acceleration. Right, these are both vectors here. F equals ma, right? Well, specifically, we're going to be talking about the force of gravity, right? So I'll use that symbology for force of gravity instead of weight. Mass, well, that's the same. And then if we're talking about uh, weight or whatever, we're talking about acceleration and y, or we're talking about g. So, you know, this goes downwards, acceleration y is negative 9.8, right? And so... I get the idea if I have a 9.8 meter per second squared acceleration downward, then I get a weight of 9.8 meters per second squared downwards. All right? So essentially, your weight is uh, mass times gravitational acceleration, and your weight pulls you downwards. This is the reason why, when we were doing 2D motion, if I had an object like this, Right, we said it always accelerates downwards. Right, acceleration y was negative uh, 9.8. Right, there was no acceleration horizontal because there was no force horizontal. If I had to do a, a free body diagram while it's in the air at all points, the free body diagram looks like this, and that is it. Right, so accelerations come from net forces. This is my only force, so that's my net force. So that, therefore, it's always accelerating downwards. The reason it does not accelerate horizontally is because there is no force horizontally. Right? There's only a downward force. Right? So there's no acceleration. Accelerations come from net forces. The net force is down, so therefore it accelerates down at the rate of 9.8. So let's do an example problem using this. Um, it says I weigh 820 newtons. Again, this is a force. So we use newtons for weight. 
uh, kilogram, that's a mass, right? Uh, sorry, mass, that's a kilogram. And then, of course, the acceleration is meters per second squared. And again, we get our kilogram meter per second, which is a newton. Okay, so 820 newtons on Earth. How much would it weigh on the moon where the gravitational acceleration, otherwise known as little g, is one-sixth of Earth's? Okay, so if on Earth we have, um, see, little g on e for Earth, I have negative 9.8. And for the most part in this chapter, that negative is not going to be uh, relative. Um, essentially, we just kind of take that away. The negative just means downward. So we're okay if we just want to, you know, occasionally just forget that and just say 9.8. Okay, because we're looking at force and we apply a direction to the force. Okay, so that means my G on moon is 1 6 G on uh, Earth. Okay, so I get one sixth of that. So that means it's one sixth of negative nine point eight. All right, and nine point eight divided by six gives me one point six three three or so um, meters per second squared. Okay, so that's what's going to be on. On um, on the moon. Um, the one thing that does not change when I go from the Earth to the moon is my mass. My mass stays the same. All right. So what is my weight? Well, if I weigh 820 newtons on Earth, um, and my mass stays the same, uh, and I have one sixth the uh, the acceleration due to gravity. If I have one sixth of this value. And this stays the same, then I should get one sixth the amount of weight. All right. Uh, let's do a little bit more formal way. So I'll, I'll say um, if I just use the Earth, the Earth, equal, you know, uh, values. I'll say 820 newtons is my weight on Earth. And uh, on Earth, I have 9.8 as my g value. So 820 divided by 9.8 means that I really have a mass of 83.67 kilograms. That's my mass. Now that value, remember, does not change when I go from the Earth to the moon. So if I want to know my weight on the moon, I use that same mass because that does not change. Kilograms, and I use the value I found for g. Uh, this um, this value here, uh, one point six three three. Okay, and as long as I multiply those together, one point six three three, and I get my weight on the moon is um, one hundred and thirty six point. I'll say 6 newtons, or about 137 newtons. All right, that happens to be one-sixth of the 820, and I could have done it that way, too. I just wanted to show um, the fact that my mass, I can find my mass. My mass does not change, all right? And um, what does change is my acceleration due to gravity, which then changes the force of gravity uh, on, on the new surface. Okay, the next force we're going to visit in a little bit more detail from last chapter is the normal force. Um, so we had two, two things. It always acts towards the object, and it's always perpendicular to the surface. That makes that 90 degrees and makes it a, you know, here's a surface right here, and this is always 90 degrees, okay? Uh, it makes it normal, right? The key thing about normal force, and this is what I call a couple of these forces, they are lazy forces it's a lazy force it only works as hard as it needs to right if I put a book on the table that table will only push up as much as it has to basically if it's a flat table we're talking about the weight of the book um, you know if I put 
the book down on the table, and then I push down additionally on top of the book. Then it has the force of my push and the um, the weight of the book together, and, it, and that normal force will grow. If I pick up on the book a little bit, just to relieve some of um, the work from the table, then guess what? The normal force of the table will drop. Um, so it's a lazy force. It only works as hard as it needs to, right? And that's what we need to think about when we do normal force, because it will grow or shrink. Think about this vector growing or shrink, growing or shrinking depending on the situation, um, and basically to support uh, only as much as it needs to. So here's our example for uh, for that situation. All right, so I'll draw a table and then um, some detail around that. Okay, I have a book on the table. That book is three kilograms. Um, so the first one says three kilogram book sits on the table. What is the normal force of the table on the book? Well, I'm going to do a free body diagram on this. Uh, because that helps me with all my problem solving and I will put it on top of the book here and then see what we have okay so I have a um, that's representing my book there uh, the idea is that my free body diagram tells me I have a certain weight that goes downwards and that weight is equal to its mass times g and then it has a normal force that opposes it. And we get the idea that these are, uh, right now, they're currently balanced. Right? Uh, they're supporting that, that normal force is acting to oppose that gravity there. Remember, they're not action-reaction pairs because the weight of the um, earth on the book is the same as the weight of the book on the earth, the gravitational force between them. And the normal forces are between the book and the surface and the earth table and the table and the book. Those are the action-reaction pairs for those. Those are separate from what we have here, which are these balance forces. All right, so how much is this normal force right here? All right, that's what I want to find, this normal force. Well, it's going to be equal to this right here. So if I do mass times, um, times g, uh, gravitational acceleration, I will use for this slide and all these slides probably 10 as a quick you know, thing. So this is what I get to use. All right? And you get to use it on the AP exam if you have to. You could probably use it on the test at the end of the chapter, but for all your homework, you'll use 9.8. Okay, so uh, my mass is 3 and G is 10, so I get a weight of 30. Okay, well, if my weight is 30 and I have this force going down and I have that force going up, that means at this time my normal force is also 30. Okay, so what's the normal force? 30 newtons. Okay, now I have put a one kilogram mass on top of the book. What is the normal force of the table on the book? So I'm gonna go draw here an additional one kilogram mass on top. Here's my one kilogram mass on top. Okay. Okay. Um, so one thing I am actually free to do now is I am free to choose um, whatever object I want. And I can even choose what we call a system of objects. So in this case, I have two objects now. Uh, they have forces that are acting in between them. But really what I want to know is if uh, what is the for normal force of the table, right? the table on the book right here. All right? And you get the idea that this table has to support both the book and it has to support the mass that's on top. And that support is being transmitted through the book, or the weight is being transmitted through the book, basically. Um, and we're going we're to get into interacting objects a little bit later. Um, but what I, what I can do is I can treat this all as one system, right? So this is one object, and anything forces in between them, which are our surface, surface forces right there, we're going to ignore, and we're just going to look at that. So what happens now? Uh, I have a one kilogram object and a three kilogram object. When they combine as one system, 
uh, they basically become a 4 kilogram object. So this 3 kilogram becomes 4. And this 30 newtons becomes 40 newtons. All right, so now if I have 40 newtons going down, then my normal force, by adding that extra thing on there, will be 40 newtons up. Okay, so my normal force grew in order to meet the new challenges of the additional, of the additional block on top. All right, uh, now I come and I push down with two newtons of force on the uh, on the mass. All right, so I still have my other thing. So now I'm gonna, you know, I've got a hand coming in or at some kind of additional, you know, um, some kind of, some kind of additional push going on here. All right. So I'm going to now add that as a point of contact. I'm not going to draw a hand here, but that's the idea. A hand is coming down and pushing down. And so I have my uh, remote force right here, my weight. All right, that's still the same. Um, and then I have my contact forces. My contact with the table is expressed by a normal force. Then I'm gonna, now I have a contact with the hand right? that is right here that's going to be additional force. All right, so forces on the object, I draw from the center. So I'm going to draw this down here, and I'm going to say there's an additional how much two newtons of force going down. That's my force applied. Oops, write that a little bit better. F A force applied. Now I'm going to draw it down here so it's a little bit clearer. I have. 40 newtons of weight going down. I have 2 newtons of applied force going down. So how much must be going up in order for this to be balanced? All right? Normal force is lazy force, only works as hard as it has to. That means there's 42 newtons of force going up. All right? If I take off that 2 newtons, guess what? This shrinks down to 40. All right? If I take off the the mass then I'm back down to 30 newtons of weight. That means my normal force will shrink down to 30. All right, so it, it will grow and shrink as long as it can. All right, for chapter five, this is still our marquee, our number one thing to keep in mind. And now we're gonna apply this in more complex situations than we did before. Last chapter, we looked at, you know, F equals MA or, you know, acceleration you know, uh, was equal to the net force um, divided by the mass, okay? So we're going to apply this now in more complex situations, not just one-dimensional, but two-dimensional uh, different situations, all right? But this is key to remember, and I'll point at it, you know, almost every problem, or I'll say it here in my, um, in my slides here, video slides, uh, for every problem. All right, when you sit down to look at, to do a problem having to do with force, the first thing that you should think about, the first thing you should say to yourself, all right, is the object accelerating? First thing. Don't even think about what kind of problem it is, whether it's an elevator problem, is it whatever. Read through it and say, is the object accelerating? If the answer is no, right? If there is no acceleration, right? Well, accelerations come from net forces, so if there is no net force, there is no acceleration. That means the sum of the forces, otherwise the net force must be zero, right? So if I had to say that in a fancy way, I would say the sum of the forces is equal to zero, otherwise known as the net force is equal to zero, okay? Because there is no acceleration, the word we call this is equilibrium, no change, everything is fine, all right? If the answer is yes, there is an acceleration, if there is an acceleration, then there is a net force, all right? So that means the sum of my forces is not equal to zero. Oops, that's the. So not equal to zero. 
And then what do I do? I apply Newton's second law. So that means the sum of my forces, there is an acceleration. Actually, let me write that a little bit different way. Uh, the acceleration is equal to my net force, whatever that is, divided by my mass. And this is Newton's second law as we wrote it. Okay? So in this case, we we're, we're applying that idea that there is no net force, there is no acceleration. Or if there is an acceleration, there is a net force. But the, no matter what, the number one thing you think of every time is the object accelerating. Yes or no, and then you go down one of these two paths. What we're going to do first is talk about how to solve problems in equilibrium. Then we're going to come back and solve problems when there is not equilibrium. So there are two cases when you are in equilibrium. Right? There, again, equilibrium means no acceleration. First question you ask yourself, is the object accelerating? If the answer is no, there's two possible reasons why. One, it is at rest, and it is remaining at rest. Two, it is moving at a constant velocity. Again, constant velocity means both magnitude, speed, and direction. All right? So if it's going in a straight line, continuing in that same straight line at the exact same speed, it is um, not accelerating. If it is at rest, we call this static equilibrium. So equilibrium means no acceleration, no net force. Static means it's not moving. If it is moving at a constant velocity and not accelerating, we call this dynamic equilibrium. Equilibrium means not accelerating. Dynamic means it's moving. All right. So if it is not moving and staying not moving, then it's at rest in static equilibrium. If it's moving at a constant velocity and staying at that same velocity, then it is in dynamic equilibrium. So here we have a rock just sitting here. Right. This, this thing right here is just sitting there, not doing anything. It is at static equilibrium. You are driving down the highway, right, and you're on cruise, you're cruising at 50 miles an hour, cruise control button is on, right, there's a bunch of forces going on, they're all canceling each other out, there is no net force, and you stay at that exact same speed, that's what your cruise control does. So let's consider uh, static equilibrium first. Um, if this is a bird's eye view and I have some kind of crate right here, right? This crate's being, you know, it's object. We're looking down on the object. It's being pulled in four directions, right? Um, then we can kind of look at this, and, and if all four people here, you know, here, 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 and here, are pulling with the same amount of force, we get the idea that this is in equilibrium. But why specifically? Well, you may say that they cancel each other out. Okay, um, is it, do they cancel each other out because they are pulling with equal force, or are they pulling an equal force and like at the same direction? What if I what if I took this one right here? What if I took F one and I said he no longer pulls, right like that? He pulls at an angle like this. Is it still in equilibrium? All right? Is it still balanced? He is kind of pulling to the right, but he's also kind of pulling, you know, down a bit, right? So specifically, what we look for when we look at equilibrium is, and this is what our mental process is, is that this one is opposing this one, right? This this guy is not not opposing that guy. Those are two different those are two different directions, right? We know, and we kind of naturally know this. So those two are canceling each other out, and then these two are canceling each other out. And there is no relationship between these two. There's nothing. Right? There's no relationship. There's no relationship between these two. There are two different, you know, two different dimensions, two different directions. So there are no relationships between those two. So essentially, I have the idea that my my left and rights are canceling each other out, and my ups and downs are canceling each other out. So let's, let's express this mathematically. Alright, so in order for something to be in equilibrium, the sum, and this is all fancy just written stuff, 
the sum of my forces, my net force, must be zero. So my sum of my forces, when I add up all my individual forces, must be zero. And again, I can write this just as easy without doing fancy math, sigma, sums, and like this. My net force right, is equal to zero. But just like we saw in that last slide, it's only because my right force canceled with my left force, and only because my up force canceled with my down force. Not because my right and up canceled each other. So what we end up doing, just like we did with vectors, we treat our horizontals completely different from our verticals. And the reason that it's not accelerating is because my horizontals cancel each other out. There's no net force horizontally, and there's no net force vertically. Right? And so what we'll see now is that those two things are separately. I could be canceled out horizontally, right? Right and left could cancel each other out, but maybe up and down does not. And then I have an acceleration, but I don't have acceleration left and right. I have an acceleration either up and down depending on that net force. So what we want to do specifically is say that, right, that the net, you know, like the net force in x, right, is 0, and the net force in y is equal to 0, right? That's, this is what satisfies us for equilibrium, that my x's cancel out and my y's, my lefts and right cancel out, and my ups and downs, because those are completely separate from each other, right? Pulling something right and pulling something up, right, does not... Those two things do not cancel each other out. They just go in a combination of those two directions. So in order for this to be true, I must have no net force in X, and I must have no net force in, in Y. Right? Whether you use this sum or whatever, or these, it doesn't matter. The key thing is that my X's cancel out my lefts and rights, and my verticals uh, cancel out too. Right? So that's going to meet my static or my equilibrium. More specifically, right, the sum of the forces, otherwise known as the net force. Right, we have this equation already. So my net force is equal to my, uh, so in this case, net force in x is equal to my mass times acceleration, Newton's second law, and that's equal to zero. And it's equal to zero because my acceleration is zero, the first question that we asked. And we'll revisit this when we get to... Uh, dynamics because we're going to have to look at this in more uh, specifics. Right? So th same thing here, this is zero, my net force and y is zero because I have no acceleration. Right? Now we're going to go through a series of example problems that will hopefully uh, reinforce this. And these are all static equilibrium problems to begin with. And then we'll get to dynamic equilibrium then we'll get into non-equilibrium problems. So the first one, we have an orangutan that weighs 500 newtons and hangs from a uh, vertical rope. Uh, what is the tension in the rope? We want to solve these in the proper way. So well, let's first identify our forces. Okay. Um, first, orangutan, it says it weighs 500 newtons, so there is a weight that is involved. It hangs from a vertical rope, right? So if I had to draw my, here's my orangutan right here, orangutan, and it hangs from a vertical rope, right? Draw my system around it. I say, what's my remote force weight, right? What is my uh, contacts? Well, the only thing that's contacting it is this rope right here. So I have some kind of tension, okay? So let me draw those two. If we buy a diagram dot right here, I have a weight going down, and that is 500 newtons. That's told me, told to me, it didn't give me mass, it just gave me weight. All right, for this to be hanging, right, which means no acceleration, so one of the first things that pops in my head, is this accelerating? No, it's not. So that means that the sum of my forces in Y must be zero. Right? I have no forces in X. My tension goes straight up. So, but my some forces in Y must be zero. So that means if this is 500 newtons down, 
and my tension must be 500 newtons up. Okay, so my tension is 500 newtons up. So that's the tension in the rope. Okay, now let's do this again with two vertical ropes. I, I'll set it up just as it had before and then um, go from there. Okay, so I drew my diagram here. I have my rain tan hanging by two vertical ropes. The rain tan is my object. Draw a circle, identify my remote force, and then I get the idea that I have one and two different tensions, and I'll call those T1 and T2, right? So I have two different tensions, one from here and another one from here, T1 and T2. All right, so now I have to diagram. Uh, my rules for weight is they always go down, straight down, and I'll say that that weight uh, is given to me, and same as last problem, 500 newtons. Okay, now I have two tensions. The tensions act in the same direction as the ropes, which means that they both act up. All right, we're going to ignore the fact that they're next to each other. We're not going to, we'll just draw them both vertical like this. Okay, and this is T1. Oops. And this is T2. Okay. So, uh, this is hanging, it's not accelerating, so that means that I must have a sum, that's my sigma, sum of forces in x must be zero, where there are no forces in x, so this is already true, and the sum of my forces in y must be zero, All right? Uh, if I wanted to make that formally, I could say, well, my t1 plus t2 you know, minus 500, and it's minus because it's down, must be equal to zero. Um, okay, uh, the one thing about this is that um, that these two tensions, they are equal. Right? They're, these ropes at the same angle, so they're going to be equal. Um, so if both of these together must be 500, 500 minus five, 500 is going to be equal to zero. That means that each one of them must be 250. So that means T1 must be 250, right? And T2 must be um, 250 newtons, okay? So some of this, I know you could probably look at this and say, well, if those two are equal and they have to be, you know, have to add up to be 500, then, you know, obviously this is 250 and that's 250. Right, but let's start thinking about going through this process here because we will start getting more complex as we go. So write down these explicit statements like this, especially if we're talking about AP exam type stuff. Just by writing these uh, statements, you will get points um, towards uh, the final uh, score. Okay, now we have an elevator that weighs 5,000 newtons and it is moving upward at a constant velocity of 10 meters per second. What is the tension in the wire? Okay, so let's draw our elevator and um, then go from there. So here's my elevator and here's my wire holding it up. Let me draw that again. Here's my wire holding it up. So I say okay I'll put an E for elevator there. There's my elevator. All right, so what forces are acting on it? Well, the first one I always do, I do my remote force, my weight. All right, and then I say what things are contacting this. Uh, we're going to ignore air friction, so the only thing left is a tension. Okay. Those are my two forces. Now... I diagram my forces, I have weight going down, and that was given to me as 5,000 newtons. Okay, and then I have tension that is going up in the direction of that wire. And I don't know how much that is, right? 
because I have this elevator that's going upwards at 10 meters per second. I got to think about that. Okay, so um, I'm going to key in. I'm going to start my thought process. Is this object accelerating? Well, it says constant velocity. Constant velocity means no acceleration. No acceleration means that there's no net force. No net force means that the sum of my forces in x must be 0, and the sum of my forces in y must be 0. All right, so if I take this, sum of my forces in y must be 0. It means that my weight plus, actually, I'll, I'll do it the other way. I'll say my tension plus my weight must be equal to 0. So my tension is what I'm trying to solve for. When I add it to my weight, down means negative, so my weight is 5,000 newtons, and that must be equal to 0. Solve for T, and I get a tension of 5,000 newtons. So eventually, again, we will be doing this much you know, this type of problem, you'll just say, okay, well, my weight is 5,000 newtons. It's moving at constant velocity, so therefore, this must be 5,000 newtons. All right, and that's okay. It's okay. You don't have to show all this stuff for something like this. But we must start thinking about this process, this process down here in identifying, because as more complex problems arises, arise, we need to address that. Okay, we have four circus workers who are trying to secure a tall wooden pole. One worker pulls north, uh, 50 newtons. Another worker pulls west, 50 newtons. A third worker pulls south with 100 newtons. What force must a fourth worker apply to keep the pole in equilibrium? All right, so in this case, we're doing a bird's eye view type problem. We're not looking at normal forces or gravitational forces. We're just looking at the bird's eye view and essentially ignoring those. Um, so we have basically uh, four forces, and that's just we're just calling them F1, uh, F2, F3, uh, F4. Okay. Um, okay. So we're gonna use this kind of like a free body diagram here. Um, so one worker pulls north 50 newtons. Let's draw that. So F1, 50 newtons. Okay, another worker pulls west, 50 newtons. So that means I'll call this like this, and I'll say F2. Fifty newtons. Okay, third worker pulls south one hundred newtons. One hundred newtons, and this is F three. All right. With what force with should a fourth worker apply to keep the pole in equilibrium? Hmm. Okay. So if there was no fourth worker, right? And I looked at this, I would have to say, is this an equilibrium? So if this is 50 newtons up and this is 100 newtons down, then those two are not canceling each other out completely. There's something left over. 100 newtons down, 50 newtons up, that's a tug of war. There's going to be a net of 50 newtons down. All right? And if this one, right to left, all right, if I have 50 newtons to the left, I'm going to need something over here to balance it out. So I'm going to need 50 newtons that way too. Let's think of this using our kind of mathematical process. So what I want is I want, in order to be in equilibrium, I want the sum of my x forces to be equal to 0, which is saying I want F2 plus F4, and specifically F4's x component, to be equal to 0. What is F2? F2 is 50 newtons. F4, x component, I do, do not know yet. That's what I'm solving for. So I want that to be 
sorry, uh, if this is F2, F2 is going to the left, so I want to make that negative. Um, F4, uh, X is, must be positive 50 newtons, okay? So I know that me, my X component must be 50 newtons uh, to the right. Sum of my Y's in order to be in equilibrium must be equal to zero, which means my F1 plus F2, oh, not F2, sorry, uh, F3 must be equal to zero. F1 is 50 newtons. I'm sorry, uh, I apologize. Uh, back up there. Uh, that means uh, that F1 plus F2 plus F4's Y component, because F4 is going to have to do some balancing in Y, must be equal to zero. All right. Uh, F1 is 50 newtons, and that's positive. And it's going uh, north. Uh, F3 uh, is uh, 100 newtons, and it's going south, so it's negative. And that's going to be uh, plus F4Y is equal to 0. All right, now let's keep on moving and try to solve for this. All right, so let's see, this is negative 50 plus F4Y is equal to 0. All right, which means that F4Y must be 50 newtons. All right, so I get the idea that my, I have to have... 50 newtons in X and 50 newtons in Y, and they're both positive, which means I need a force that goes into F4X, 50 newtons in F, oops, wrong direction, F4, Y, 50 newtons. So this is 50, and this is 50. Newtons also. Okay, so what do I end up with? All right, I have an x and a y component, and I need a resultant. So I'm going to add those. So I say, okay, that's like 50 here and 50 here. All right, and this is my resultant. 45 degrees is going to be my angle because those are equal. And then now I have to do the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, to find that out. So the square root of 50 uh, squared plus 50 squared. And so I had to pull at 70 newtons, 70.7 uh, newtons at 45 degree angle, or 45 degrees uh, north of east, or basically northeast. All right, so if I had to draw that in my free body diagram now, in order for all this to balance out, I'd have to do 70 newtons, 70.7, um, and then at a 45 degree angle. All right. So to rehash or to, to look at this again, I had four forces. All right. Uh, the fourth was unknown, but I knew that these three forces, when combined with, you know, another set of forces in X and Y um, would have to cancel each other out to stay in equilibrium. I applied my equilibrium equation right in X that my horizontal has to have something over here, so I found what that X component of that fourth vector needed to be, or the fourth force, so I found this to be 50 newtons. I also had to find that my Y's needed to cancel out, which means I needed another 50 newtons going this way. So this this uh, fourth force had to have both 50 newtons going uh, east and 50 newtons going north. When I combine that, I get 70.7 .7 newtons going northeast. Okay, now we're getting a little bit more complicated. A car with a mass of 1,500 kilograms is being towed at a constant speed by a rope held 20 degrees above the horizontal. A friction force of 320 newtons opposes the car's motion. What is the tension of the rope? So I'm going to pause here and uh, do a little diagram uh, to, to work off of.
Okay, I have my diagram here. I have my car. It's being towed um, by a rope uh, that's 20 degrees above the horizontal. Okay, and so that's my diagram. And so I go through my thinking process. What's my remote force? That's always there. That's weight. Um, okay, and then I look at what else is this in contact with. So the first thing I'm going to say is that it's in contact with that rope. Therefore, there is a tension. All right, now I'm in contact with the surface here. <clears throat> and so um, I need to show that. There's two types of things that are coming from that surface. The first one is a support, which is a normal force, a surface-to-surface -surface contact. And the other one is a, because it tells me this, is a frictional force. And if it's in motion, we'll call that kinetic friction. All right, so let me go over here for my free body diagram and apply um, my principles for each one of these. Weight goes straight down. Okay. Uh, let's see, tension is in the direction of the, for of the rope. So this means my tension's here, and that this is a 20 degree angle. Um, let's see, I have a normal force. Normal force is always perpendicular to the surface, so it goes like this. All right, that's my normal force. <clears throat> and the last one I have is a kinetic friction. And that means it's parallel to the surface and opposes the direction of motion. So my drawing here, this thing is moving... Um, it has some kind of speed to the right. Um, and it says constant speed, so I know this is not accelerating. So, okay, so I have to draw my um, kinetic friction here. Okay, now I have my four forces that are going on. All right, now I'll get to this, this step and I say, is this object accelerating? It says constant speed, right? So constant speed is the key thing, and that says no. This is not accelerating. Okay, that means that the sum of my forces in X must be equal to zero. Okay, and um, so I look at what forces do I have. So that's going to be equal to zero. I have two forces. Um, really, I have this um, kinetic friction which I'm trying, uh, which I do have that value. And uh, I actually have, if I look over here to the right, uh, I have this tension. This tension is at an angle, right? Which implies that it's a vector at an angle, which means it has a horizontal component to it, right? And it has a vertical component. And I'll go ahead and label that TY. Okay? Um... And so, if I mentally think about that being broken up into an X and into a Y component, um, then uh, I can actually treat that, right? There's an X and a Y component uh, to this tension, and that's what I'm going to use to solve. So, I'm going to go solve for that right now. Uh, so, I'm going to say this uh, kinetic friction plus, and I'll put it the same color, TX, is equal to zero, all right? Uh, and now I'm going to substitute and solve for this. My kinetic friction uh, it says is 320 newtons and it poses direction, so I'm going to call that negative 320 newtons plus Tx is equal to zero. All right, so what does that mean? That means that my horizontal tension is equal to positive 320 newtons. That's what's going to be required for this to be an equilibrium in the X. Okay, typically, I may have to go, depending on what the question is asked, I may have to go and look at the Y statement, right? Um, and again, that, that Y statement would be the sum of my forces in Y uh, would be equal to zero, which is the idea that my, let's say, normal force plus my tension in Y... Um, you know, plus my weight, which is really subtraction, is going to be equal to zero. So typically I would have to go and then do some business here. Um, I just want to go ahead and write that statement, but we don't actually have to do that. 
Um, essentially, if I know my horizontal tension, which is required, uh, which we found is 320 newtons, um, and if I know my horizontal tension is equal to 320 newtons, um, and I know that my angle right here for my overall one is 20 degrees, and uh, I don't know my y, which is right here, um, but if I have my angle right here, <coughs> I'm trying to fall, find this right here, I have an adjacent and I have an angle, um, and so I'm trying to find a hypotenuse, so I can actually use cosine and do that. So I can say cosine 20 degrees is equal to my adjacent, which is this 320 newtons, over my hypotenuse, which is my overall tension. So if I want to solve for tension, that's equal to my 320 divided by cosine 20 degrees. Okay, so 320 divided by cosine 20. Um, is 340 newtons, okay, um, 341-ish, about the same, all right, so that's how, what's required for this tension right here, all right, so this tension um, right here has to be 340 newtons, when broken out, the horizontal component has to be 320, and I could actually find what that y component had to be um, and we'll have problems later on, we'll have to do it. Basically, if I wanted to know what this normal force was, then uh, I can easily calculate the weight. I can easily calculate the weight. Uh, I can use what I know about the tension to find this, and if I wanted to find my normal force, I would have to, you know, solve for both of these, and then I could find my normal force. Okay, another problem here. A sign is suspended by two cables, each with a tension T1, um, each with, it, with its own tension T1 and T2. Um, if a 980 newton weight is attached to the cables, what is the tension um, in each of these cables? Uh, I already have a diagram here, so I'm just going to go with that. Um, so I'm going to say, here's my object, draw a circle around it, and I say, okay, what forces are acting on it? Uh, first thing is my remote force, always my remote force, and I have a weight, right? Uh, that weight's already given to me, 980 newtons, okay? And then I have two other forces, uh, I have T1 and T2, these two, two, two wires are providing tension, T1 and T, T2. Uh, so let's diagram these. Uh, weight always goes straight down. And I'll say weight is here, and I'm already given that number, so I'm going to say 980 newtons. All right, I have a tension going off this way, T1. And I have a tension going off this way, T2. All right, um, these are both at... 60 degree angles right here. Okay, both at 60 degrees. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you that if those angles are the same, then each one of those tensions are going to be equal. Now, this is different from when we had the orangutan uh, holding two ropes because, um, you know, this we had 980 newtons going down, let's say in that case. Um, these two tensions are not just 980 divided by 2 because there is an angle involved. If these were directly uh, directly vertical, then yes, you'd say whatever this weight is, divided by 2, each, each one would have to carry that weight. But since we're at angles, uh, they will be equal to each other, but they're going to have to actually carry more than 980 newtons, uh, which is pretty interesting. So what we have to identify is the fact that I have forces at angles, right? These are forces at angles. And so that means that they have components. This this one right here has an x component 
and it has a y component t2 y all right this tension right there on the left has a I'll go ahead and say y component t1 y and it has an x component t1 x okay all right so I'm going to use these components in really my free body diagram. Then I'm going to add them back up to these main tensions. So what I'm going to concentrate is just the weight going down and the two Y components going up and then the two X components going horizontally. Essentially once I break these into X's and Y's I ignore the main vector until I need to deal with it. Okay, so this uh, next question is this accelerating it's hanging in place so it is not so I know that the uh, and I'm gonna move this over so I can kind of see this I know that the sum of my vectors and I'll do X first um, no and I can do X I'm gonna do Y first sum of my vectors in uh, Y is equal to 0 okay what are my vectors in Y uh, t1 y plus t2 y plus the weight is going to have to be equal to 0. Okay? That's summing up my y vectors. I have, um, I have 2 going up and 1 going down. Alright, so I know my weight already. So I can plug that in. Um, and what I'm going to go ahead and say is that I know since uh, both of these tensions are the same, because they're at the same angles, both of these Y components are the same. Essentially, um, if I just looked at my verticals, this is like the orangutan being supported by two ropes. Right? So these two Y components are sharing the load of this 980 newtons. So essentially I already know that whatever I get for whatever this is, these y components are going to each one of these is going to be one half, all right. So it's not that the tension is shared uh, equally, but that the um, the y components share the weight, all right. So I'll just call this. I'll call it right now. I'll call it something generic. T um, T y, right? There's two of them. These are equal. So when I add them together, I'll just call it something generic. Two two times T y, and I get the idea that they're the same for each one. Um, and then the weight is going to be 980 newtons going down, so I use negative for that, and that's equal to 0. So when I solve, I get 2ty is equal to positive 980, and then that means ty, so the y components of each one, we're just saying t1y and t2y, are equal to uh, 980 divided by 2, 490 newtons, okay? 490 newtons each, each of those Y components has to support. All right, now the question says, what is the tension in each cable, All right? So now I have to look at this. I know each one of these is 490 newtons. I know this angle right here, and um, I don't have to actually go through the process on my X components. So let me just draw, I'll draw T1, or the tension for, from one of them over here to the side. I get T1Y, uh, and that's equal to 490 newtons. We just found that. Okay, and then when I add... T1x, I get that value, and then essentially what I'm trying to solve for is this right here. Um, I kind of made a mistake, I probably should have set it up more like this, I'm oh, sorry, that's the wrong color, and um, I probably should have set it up this way, and then, but you get the idea. 
that if um, if this is 60 degrees here, uh, then that means that this is 30. Okay, so I, pr I probably should have set up, but I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use uh, the 30 degree side up up here. Okay, and then um, so I made a little bit of mistake, but it still still works out. All right, so if I want to find essentially what I'm trying to find is this tension right here. I have an angle angle right here, I have an adjacent, I'm trying to find a hypotenuse so I can actually solve for that and so what I'm going to say is that the um, let's go back, so I'm using cosine 30 degrees is equal to my y tension which is 490 which is my adjacent divided by my hypotenuse which I'm trying to solve for which is my tension rearrange that and I get my tension which I'm trying to solve for is equal to 490 divided by uh, cosine 30. Okay, and 490 divided by cosine 30 gives me a tension of 566. Now in class we're going to take this a little bit further and go through a few different slides and and imagine uh, what if that that angle increased. And essentially, um, you got to realize that if this angle, uh, sorry, if this angle decreases, basically it comes out further out like this. There's actually going to be more and more tension the more that that angle decreases. Essentially, this y components are still staying the same no matter what this angle is. These y components still have to support 980 newtons. But when it's no longer cosine 30, it's cosine 60, cosine 80, cosine, you know, near 90, um, then this right here really shoots up. So cosine of 80 degrees makes a much larger tension overall than cosine of 30 degrees. And uh, this is evident whenever you have to hang something with wires. Um, you know, completely vertical is the best, the least amount of tension. But if you have to hang something at angles, the amount of tension in the wires will actually increase uh, as that angle uh, increases, um, or really this angle increases uh, more and more. All right, next problem that we will continue with, uh, the wrecking ball weighs 250 newtons, hangs from a cable, then pulled back 20, uh, sorry, then pulled back by second horizontal cable to an angle of 20 degrees. If it is motionless, what is the tension in the horizontal cable? Regardless of what we do, the first thing we do is we draw a picture, which is already uh, provided. I identify my object, which is the wrecking ball. Identify the forces. What are forces are acting on the wrecking ball? First, my remote force, weight. Uh, then I'll look at this, and I'll call this one T1, and I'll call this one T2. Uh, and I have T1 and T2. Okay. I draw this in my picture using my principles. My weight always goes down. Uh, was that given to me? Yes, it's given to me as 25, uh, sorry, 2,500 Newtons. All right, and then I have two tensions. Uh, T1 goes completely horizontal to the left. And then T2 goes off at an angle like this. All right, so now I'll get to the part um, that I actually had to start thinking, um, is this accelerating, All right? Um, if it is, then that there is a net force. If it is not, then there is not a net force. So if it says that it is motionless, right, and it's remaining motionless, that means it is not accelerating. All right, so I start saying that my sum of forces in X is equal to zero, my sum of forces in y is equal to zero. Okay, we'll hold off on the y's here for a second. Um, first of all, I have a vector at an angle. T2 is a vector at an angle, and I hate vectors at angles. Uh, so I'm going to draw something and then, you know, erase it. Essentially, there is a, you know, x component to T2, T2x. And then there is a y component to T2. I drew it over here right now. Uh, I'm going to come back and erase that now. The one thing I want to point out is that 
this uh, this angle is 20 degrees All right so this angle is 20 degrees uh, this is 90 then that makes this 70 and this is the angle I'm actually going to use because it's more convenient All right so let's see if I can erase some specific things here and I cannot um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to redraw this over here I'm sorry I'm going to have two of those pink arrows and essentially I want you to scratch out and ignore this one right because it won't let me erase it uh, and uh, this is T 2 Y Okay, and this is, uh, we said that th the top angle is 20, which makes this one 70 degrees here. Okay, uh, and after I kind of break this into X and Y, I kind of ignore T2, and I only look at the X's and I only look at the Y's. So some of my forces in X, well, that's T1 plus T2X. I don't need those vector arrows really for x components, but right, those two together must be equal to zero. Hmm. So I don't know what t1 is. I don't know what t2 is either, or t2x is. So I'm going to come back to this one. I'm going to leave plenty of space, and I'm going to go look at my y components. So sum of my forces in y must be equal to 0. Uh, what do I have? I have t2y uh, plus my weight. That has to be equal to 0. So t2y is what I'm actually going to be solving for in the short term is equal to my weight, which is 2,500 newtons. All right, so what does that mean? That means that T2Y is equal to negative, oops, I'm sorry, um, erase some of this right here. So this is, this is actually uh, it's negative because weight goes down. Uh, T2Y is equal to uh, positive 2,500 newtons. Okay. Uh, remember, I'm trying to solve for T1, which is this horizontal force right here. I'm trying to solve for that. All right. In order to know this one, I have to know this. All right. So actually, I if I if I can find this, I can find that. But using next component, I can actually use this Y component to find this. So let me redraw um, this um, triangle up here and then use that. So I'll say I have T2X, I have T2Y, and I know that this is a 70 degree angle. I just found that my T2Y was 2500 newtons. So let's, let's write that out, 2,500 newtons, okay? Um, all right, so if I know my angle and I know my um, opposite, I could go and find this overall tension, but I really don't care about that. What I care about, because I'm trying to find my horizontal, is this guy right here. That's what I care about. So I'm actually going to use um, tangent. So if I say tangent... 70 degrees, that equals to my opposite, my opposite is 2,500 newtons, uh, divided by my adjacent, which is T2x, which I'm trying to solve in the, f in the short term so I can find this T1 right here, see so if I know this, then I know this, alright, and so um, I rearrange this and I get T2x, is equal to um, 2,500 newtons divided by uh, tangent 70 degrees. Okay, 2,500 divided by tangent 70 is 910 uh, newtons. T2x is equal to 910 newtons. Okay, now. 
I now have that value, I can go back to this equation here. I'm trying to solve for t1. I know that my uh, t2x is to the right, so that's going to be positive 910 newtons. And that is equal to 0. So what does it mean? That means that tension in the T1 is equal to negative 910 newtons. And that negative just means it's to the left. So I'm okay with that. So that means 910 newtons to the left, right? Which is much less than the 2,500 newtons. Um, that's kind of uh, vertical in, in this component uh, right here, right? So this is a lot. This is little. It kind of makes sense with that 70 degree angle. This would be a lot, and this would be a little, but this only has to oppose this, okay? So, there's different ways to solve these. If you follow these equations right here, right, and something equals zero, then it becomes much more of a numerical analysis, right? There's different ways to think about this, that, you know, whatever is going down must have an up, and that up, you know, um, you, you can follow this process here, too, um, but... You can't go wrong with this system right here. Okay, this is an interesting one because it really uh, asks us to look at things, whether I want to treat things as one objects or multiple objects as one system. Um, so uh, the easiest thing to do is kind of talk about that um, uh, initially. I have the option as I go and solve this problem whether I want to treat these as uh, separate objects like this, right, and each one I have separate objects. I look at the, you know, I have a weight force for each object that's given to me right here, and then I look at my contacts, which would be tension 1, 2, and 3 as contact points. Now, depending on the problem or the question, I have this option. Let me erase this. I have this option. Essentially, all of these are connected, and I have the possibility of using this as one entire object. The 60 newtons and the 120 newton masses as one um, entire object. And that would have a combined weight of 180 newtons. Okay? And actually, we're going to start off with this. We're going to start off with the idea that this is all one, one weight or one, one mass, and one system, because I want to find out what is the tension in, in uh, cable 1 right here? So I'm going to find that tension right there. So essentially, uh, what do I have? I have a weight going down. If I'm using all of that as one system, then that weight is 60 newtons plus 120 newtons. So that means 180 newtons going down. All right? And that means that I have a tension going up. T1, all right, and that tension, oh, well, it's in equilibrium, so that means that tension in 1 must be 180 newtons, okay? That's an easy one. I didn't have to break anything apart. I just looked at um, my tension of the whole system, okay? So now I'm going to modify this. I found T1. I'm happy with that. But in order to find the details of T2 and T3, I have to treat this now as two different objects, all right, and this is going to be a strategy that we'll have when we talk about interacting objects. So this is one object. This is another object. So let's look, let's find T2 and T3. The easiest way to do that is by actually looking at this bottom object right here. So now I'm looking at the 120 newton mass. So I have my weight going down, and that weight is equal to 120 newtons. I have two tensions, T2 and T3 going up. They are equal. They're parallel to each other. There's no angles. There's no anything else like that. Uh, so they, they are equal to each other. And um, so, and they're both going up. So I do my summation equation in Y, which is equal to my T2 plus T3 plus the weight is equal to zero. Um, T2 and three, two, two and three are equal to each other. 
Uh, so really what I have is the idea that my weight is going down at 120 newtons. So I'll just say 2 times tension um, of each. And that means that this is 120. And that means really fundamentally that each one is supporting 60 newtons worth of force. Okay? Um, so yeah, so this is the same thing as T2 or T3. Right, 60 newtons. So 180 newtons for all of them for T1 because it has to support everything above it, and then 60 newtons each. Uh, I could verify about this by looking at just if I did a free body diagram of this one. Uh, I looked at it; it has a weight going down, and that weight is equal to 60 newtons. I know that T1 was 180 newtons going up. But also have T2 and T3 that are contacting it, and so I'll draw those next to each other. And each one of those is 60 newtons. So essentially I have 60, 60, and 60. I have 180 going down, and I have 180 going up. Okay, so for this problem I'm going to address it, uh, but I am not going to um, do the actual complex problem solving. There's a system equation that goes on here, um, and I have taught this in the past. Uh, I'm just unsure at this point whether the AP would require this level of detail uh, for um, the algebra-based physics or not. Um, but the concept should be um, definitely applied. Uh, one thing I want you to know is that if I looked at this, I would have, um, actually I will do the free body diagram here. I have a weight going down. Uh, that weight is 153 kilograms times what I will use as 10. So 100 and, uh, 1,530 newtons. Okay, I have two tensions here. One is at uh, 45 degrees. Uh, the other one's at 30 uh, if I look, use my complementary angles, all that kind of stuff, this is 45 degrees. And that means that this right here is 30 degrees. T1, T2. It means that this has an X component. So does this one. This one has a Y component. Right. T1, Y and T2Y. Okay, so we've broken this up, and uh, one thing I want you to notice is that put yourself in this situation, um, the best thing you can think about is monkey bars as a kid, and you're going from one bar to the other. You basically have your, your weight that is supported by the arm that is more directly above you, and as you're reaching for the next bar, um, Basically, that bar, that, that, that arm that is reaching for the next bar, which is kind of extended further out at a lower angle, um, doesn't really bear your weight. It's just, it's, it's, um, it's just kind of pulling you in that direction. And it's the one above you that's always kind of bearing your weight more. It's the one with the greater angle that does that. And the one horizontal just kind of starts bringing you in that direction. So in this case, you have this very similar thing. Uh, so I just fundamentally want you to know uh, in this, these kind of examples that the the one that actually is extended um, at the lower at the sorry the lower angle um, is the one at the lower angle has less tension than the one at the higher angle because this one is bearing more of the weight, right? So these two are not equal in this case, right? So in this case, t two y is greater than t one y. Uh, even though they're kind of drawn um, equal in this case, but they're, they're not actually, and that creates an imbalance. And so, essentially, whichever one is has the uh, the greater angle, right, in this case, um, is supporting more of the weight and has a greater amount of tension. The one that's out uh, wider is just providing mostly horizontal support um, and not so much vertical support. Okay, now this is our first our introduction to ramp problems. Um, there's only one key thing that yet, or two key things that we have to do for ramps. Um, one is understand that our forces still act the same way, perpendicular to the incline or the surface, you know, directly down. 
the other thing that we we can do in this case is we can change the way our axis actually looks. So let's look at that first. Um, first thing we're going to do instead of saying a regular axis where we have you know x going this way and y going this way, what we're going to actually do is what I call tilt our head. So we're going to say that x goes let's say up the plane, or it could be down, but we'll say up the plane, and then y goes perpendicular to the plane. All right, now this is, you'll see in a little bit, it makes it a whole lot more simpler uh, to deal with when we do this. All right, so for now, we'll get rid of these right now, and then let's look at how we go about our problem solving here. All right, so zoom back out. We have a 5 kilogram block sits at rest on a 30 degree ramp. What is the force of friction acting on the ramp, what is the normal force? Okay, so first of all, here's my here's my object. All right, and so what kind of forces do I have? I have weight that is acting down. Weight always acts down the page, and I will go ahead and calculate that because that is uh, five kilograms. Five times ten, I get to use ten um, is fifty newtons. Of gravitational force. All right, what else is it in contact with? It's in contact with the surface. So what's the surface doing? Surface is providing a normal force like this. Okay, a normal force. Uh, what is the surface also doing? It's providing a frictional force, and that frictional force is up the ramp. So essentially this is a frictional force and a static friction. All right. All right, so now we identify the fact that um, uh, this, this object is at rest, right? It sits at rest, which means that all my forces um, are going to, you know, cancel out and there will be an equilibrium. So I would typically write the statement, my equilibrium statement, all my sum of forces in X is equal to zero and all the sum of forces in Y is equal to zero. Uh, I'm going to hold off on that because I want to identify something first. First of all, if I just look at a traditional X and Y orientation, what I would notice is that this weight is the only force that is going like either straight up and down or left and right. And these two essentially would be vectors at angles. All right. And so I'd have to split this into an X and into Y. And I'd have to split this into an X and into a Y. And this actually isn't that bad. This would be two of them, and one I wouldn't have to split up. But when we get more complicated ones, uh, it becomes an issue. And this is where we get to uh, cheat a little bit, and essentially um, what I call tilt our head. So essentially what we're going to do is say that, as I showed earlier, you know, we're, this is my X-axis along the green dotted line. And this is my y-axis along that kind of fuchsia kind of uh, line there. All right. And so now I have now I have two forces that are along the uh, x and y-axis, and I only have one force, which is weight, which is not. And everything else is nice, nice. And this one is the odd one out now. Um, and so, um, we have to break this one into an X and Y component. And essentially, I have to break this now, because my, my X's and Y's are at angles now. I have to break this into an X component, and I have to break this into a Y component. The best way I can describe this is tilting your head. If you just tilt your head, or turn the screen a little bit, whatever, tilt your head then everything can make kind of sense. Um, actually, I'm going to clean this up a little bit because I don't like the way that looks. All right, because I want to show that this Y component here is going to be completely opposite of that normal force. So I'm going to clean that up a little bit. Okay. Now, you say, how can I figure out what that is? I don't know any kind of angle associated with this. So what I'll go ahead and tell you and something this is just go ahead and memorize that this angle right here is the same as the angle of the ramp. Whatever angle of the ramp is, that's what this angle is right here. All right. So 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this weight and I'm going to break it up into a x and a y component. And I'll go over here first and uh, you know this is something we'll eventually kind of memorize but uh, so essentially this is 30 degree, uh, this is 50 right here 50 newtons and then we'll break this into a x I'm sorry that's a y so a weight y and a weight x and again that weight x is going to be we'll move it up you know to where it is on that left diagram there uh, we know that this is 90 degrees and that this right here is 30 all right so if I want to find my x component then I know that my x component here is going to be my hypotenuse 50 times uh, okay that's an opposite and then a hypotenuse so I'm talking about sine so sine 30 degrees <clears throat> and if I'm looking for a y component that's going to be 50 times cosine 30 degrees since it's my adjacent right and um, this will always be true my x component will always be um, the sine and my y component will always be the cosine so go ahead and memorize that that if I want to find the x component of weight on a ramp then it's the weight times sine of the angle of the ramp if I want to find my y component um, of weight on a ramp then it's going to be my weight times the cosine component um, uh, sorry the cosine of the angle of the ramp alright so I calculate these values and I get, um, for my Y component, I get 43.3 uh, Newtons. And for my cosine, or my, uh, sorry, my sine component, my X component, uh, I get 25 Newtons. That's one, because cosine of 30 is, is one half. All right. So now I know these values. This is 43.3. And this is 25 Newtons. It's that N for Newtons. All right, now, all right, now we're going to go back and say this is an equilibrium. So that, therefore, my um, my x components all um, add up to to be zero. So the sum of my x forces is equal to zero. That means my weight of x plus my Static friction is equal to zero. All right, my uh, weight in X is uh, 25 newtons, so I'll say 25 newtons to the left or down the ramp. That's negative. Uh, plus my static friction is equal to zero. Uh, that means my static friction is equal to 25 newtons. What is the force of friction acting on the ramp? 25 newtons. Okay, now I'll continue with this. Second question is, what is a normal force? Well, let's look at that. Sum of my y components has to be equal to zero. That is equal to normal force plus the weight. Uh, and specifically, not just the weight, but the weight in y. Okay, so my normal force is what I'm asked to find, and then I'm going to add my weight which is actually a negative value because it's going down in, or into the ramp 43.3 is equal to 0 so what is my normal force my normal force is 43.3 newtons all right and if I actually looked um, you know from here now, to talk about my x's and y's, uh, once I broke this into an x and to the y, I ignore all of this from now on. Now, in order for this to be uh, canceled out, then my x's must cancel out. So if this is 25 newtons down the ramp, then I must have 25 newtons up the ramp. If the weight is 43 newtons into the ramp, then my normal force must be uh, 43 newtons supporting because my normal force is a lazy force and it only works as hard as it needs to work okay so the key thing here is I get to change my 
my axes instead of going a traditional up and down and left, you know, whatever. I get to go up the ramp and perpendicular to ramp as an X and to the Y, which makes my life a whole lot easier when it comes to only one vector that has to be broken down. The angle of the ramp is always this angle between the weight and the Y component right there. The horizontal, sorry, the, the X component of the weight down the ramp is always is always the sine component. The, the weight in Y is always the cosine. Okay, we'll briefly go down uh, this path, uh, only really to a certain point that we have identified what we need. Uh, also a 5 kilogram block, but now it's sliding down the ramp um, at a constant speed. What's the force of friction along uh, acting on the ramp? Here's my object. So what forces do I have? I have weight. Uh, and again, 5 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared means 50 newtons. All right, what else do I have? I have a normal force that's supporting, that's perpendicular. And then I have friction that opposes up the ramp. And what kind of friction is that? That is kinetic friction. Okay. Uh, and again, as we said before, we can break this, you know, our X's, and, our X's and Y's are at angles now. So we have to adjust for that now, saying that uh, my kinetic friction, my normal force are the same. Uh, sorry, are, um, are on the axes correctly. And that these, um, the weight is not. So I have to break it into an X and into a Y. All right, now... This is 30 degrees, and so on, so on. Okay, so actually, if I just take a step back, because my next step is going to be, uh, is this accelerating? Is it? Uh, no, it says it at a constant speed. That means that all of my X's cancel out, and all of my Y's cancel out. Again, I have ignored this once I broke this up. All right, um... My y component, my x component, is always uh, uh, my weight times sine 30. Uh, sine 30 is one half, so this is 25. This is 25 newtons, which is exactly the same as it was last problem. So the fact that it's actually going down the ramp at a constant speed does not change the force of friction. The force of friction is canceling out whatever is going down the ramp. So guess what? Even though this is kinetic friction in this case, this is also 25 newtons, okay? So it's actually the same problem, the same setup from the last one, except instead of being at rest, which is equilibrium, static equilibrium, we're in dynamic e equilibrium. It just happens to be moving, but still the forces cancel out and the forces are the same. And so the exact same thing would happen uh, in the vertical too if I wanted the normal force this would come out to be 43.3, which was the last problem, which means that my normal force would also be 43.3 newtons. Okay? So keep this in mind as you go along. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if it's at rest or sliding down a ramp at a constant uh, speed. That Either way, that indicates that everything cancels out as long as the mass is the same, the angle of the ramp is the same, then my frictions and everything else will also be the same. Okay, last example for this section. Uh, a 2,000 kilogram elevator is lifted at a constant speed of 3 meters per second for a distance of 20 meters. What is the tension in the supporting wire? So, I have my elevator here. Draw a circle around my object. What forces are there that are remote? I have weight going down. And what else is in contact? I have a tension going up. All right, so I have tension and then weight. Uh, I'll go ahead and calculate my weight. If it's 2,000 kilograms, and I use 10 instead of 9.8, uh, that gives me roughly about 20,000 um, newtons. All right, so 20,000 newtons is the weight. Next thing I ask, uh, it says, what is the tension in the supporting wire? Uh, mentally, I ask myself, first step, is this accelerating? And so it says constant speed, right? So that is not acceleration. 
So accelerations come from net forces, so if there's no accelerations, then there is no net force, which means uh, the sum of all my forces, and in this case I only have y forces, must be equal to zero, so which means my tension plus my weight has to be equal to zero. Tension plus, well actually it's going to be tension minus uh, 2,000 newtons, I'm sorry, 20,000 newtons is equal to zero. That means my tension must be 20,000 newtons, okay? So, here's the idea. Um, the, the fact that this is, um, the fact that this is moving up or it moved the distance of 20 meters does not matter at all. Now, the tension in the wire, in order to pull this thing up, lift it up, um, at a constant speed is the same as the weight, which is the same amount of tension it would take to actually just hold it in place. Now, this seems a little strange, but if you actually think about it, you know, and what is required, once something um, is accelerated, gain speed, all you have to do is keep it at that speed. So you just have to cancel out, in this case, weight. All right? If you want to accelerate it, then you're going to have to pull faster, um, sorry, pull harder than the weight. If you want to decelerate it upwards, um, or decelerate it while it's traveling upwards to slow it down, then your tension would have to be less than the weight. So this is what we're going to look at next, is what if these are not balanced anymore? How does this elevator work? All right. If these are the same, then it moves, either doesn't move at all and stays that way, or it moves at a constant rate. But if this tension is greater than this weight, then I'm going to have a net force. And that net force is going to go up, which means that my acceleration is also going to go up, which means that it's going to pick up speed. And if I want to do the opposite, where it decelerates or it accelerates downwards, then this tension is going to have to be less than this weight. right? And so the weight's going to take over and slow it down, and then that's how it stops <clears throat> where it needs to be. Okay, and we'll address that next in our dynamics section.